Eventually, his buddy Mike goes and finds a couple of guys that have already been to federal prison for bank robbery. Jamar says, look, if you stop the truck on route, we're gonna open the back, we're gonna give you the money. And so he told them, look, stop us on this route at this time. Set himself up. Did you write this, man? You, you have- you... Oh, this is all done. Oh, listen, it gets better. So real quick, what happens is this. Listen, the, the best part of this, which was weird at first, right? Like when I first did start doing podcasts and, and I did one on concrete and it got like 2 million and change, you know? And so people start calling me and they're like, they bought my book. They want to meet me. Can I sign my book? They'll buy me lunch. First, I was really like, like, that's weird. Like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. That's odd. And then I remember a friend of mine who I, I actually, I was renting her spare room. I was living in her spare room. She said, listen, she's like, you didn't know how you were going to make a living. She's like, these people, for, she said, like Gary v uh, Vaynerchuk. You know who that is? Gary v like, I love watching his stuff. I don't really watch it anymore. But at the time I did. She was that guy, Gary Vaynerchuk. She said, if you could meet him, would you? And I went, yeah, of course. That's, of course. Right. She said, okay, well, you're Gary Vayner Vaynerchuk to some of these people. She says, so stop being a douchebag about it. And go meet the guy for lunch. And, you know, she's a little blunt. Um, so I met, I met this guy for lunch and we had this just normal conversation he, and he, he did have that whole like, wow, I can't believe I'm talking to you. And I'm yeah. thinking I was in prison a few months ago, yeah. Like, yeah. but as that's been happening, I got used to it because obviously I'm narcissistic. So I of course love it. <laughs> the, the best one that ever happened was <laughs> I was with my girlfriend who's at the time I'm married to her now, but not impressed if with anything I'm doing. Um, she, we, we went to dinner with her and her daughter and we're leaving dinner. Um, and by this time I'd been on a ton of fucking shows. Uh -huh. Um, and some guy comes running up to me as we're walking out and he goes, excuse me, excuse me, uh, sir, sir. And I turn around and I go, yeah, what's up? I thought maybe he's waiter. Like maybe I had left my, my, um, license or I'm right, sorry, my right. credit card or something. I start looking for my wallet. I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he goes, oh, I just want to let you know that like. Bro, like, like I, I, you know, he said, he said, I, um, I didn't want to interrupt you guys, but, uh, he said, I think everything you're doing is like, you know, like I, I, I totally like, and the way he said it was weird. He goes, I totally support like everything you're doing. And I went, do I know you? And he goes, bro, I, I, I follow you like on, on everything. And I watch your stuff and I've watched your interviews. And so I follow you on Instagram and YouTube. And, and I went. And then it dawned on me. I was like, oh, I said, yeah, bro, I appreciate that, man. Um, um, he goes, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, you're you're like, you're inspiring. And I turned to my my girlfriend at the time yeah. and I go, inspiring. <laughs> you hear that? <laughs> inspiring. And he goes, you know, I'm so sorry, man. He's like, I didn't want to interrupt you guys. I said, no, no, I said, you did the right thing. You did the right thing. And he goes, I mean, but bro, you're like, you are, you're amazing. And I go, amazing. He That's said, amazing. Great. And I shake his hand. I'm like, thank you so much, bro. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thanks, man. I just want to meet you. I said, ah. And he walks off. That's and, terrific, man. Listen, I always tell my girlfriend, my wife now, I'm like, it doesn't, if somebody recognizes me and says something, it doesn't mean anything unless you're there to gloat, for me to gloat. <laughs> it means nothing. I'm like, yeah, hey, what's up? How's it? Cool. I appreciate it. No problem. And right, right. Like, and I text her. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, all right. <laughs> that's great man that's great you don't know you never know who's watching you never know who's hanging on stuff and just the same you are with someone else at, you know at, at certain certain points but it's, it's odd it's an odd feeling but it, uh, it is yeah. i was gonna say i mean can you imagine bro i'm in prison laying in a bunk bed with 180 guys oh, snoring and burping yeah. and yelling and you know trying to sleep and toilets are flushing in the background and I'm wrapping my head up with a towel so I can just you know get some try and get some sleep yeah. and a few months later I'm walking through an airport I'm standing in line in an airport you know in line and guys are looking at me and looking and then next thing you know two guys come up to me and they're like you're Matt Cox, aren't you? And I'm like, you know, of course they pulled their phones out and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, bro. Yeah. What's up, bro, man. I got your book. Um, I watch you on, uh, uh, Vlad, uh, and they start going on like, and they're shaking my hand and everything. I'm like, you know, Hey, what's up? Cool. Yeah. And then they leave. And then of course the people in line around you are now. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, it's just, the, it is like, it's like the extreme yeah. from one to another is just insane. That's something, man. I can kind of relate on, on, a, on a level of what you're saying as you're telling me about it. Because when I was in um, 
when I was in Baghdad, I came back and it was like one one day in combat. And then the next day, you know, my aunt and uncle are coming over to say hello and have some, you know, have dinner. And uh, and, and my friends would come over and well, and I was like, where the fuck am I? Like, yeah. How did this? Right. Yeah. How so you went, I went from, yeah, one extreme to the other. Yeah. Just like that. So I, I kind of get what you're saying there, man. I give you a lot of credit. I, I don't know how you kept, whew, that's a lot of guys to be in a room with. That's a lot of threats, man. Maybe I just have high anxiety from things I've went through with that. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a road you went through, man. Jeez. Well, I mean, I was, I was, well, when you're in like a, what do they call them? Uh, like a dorm like that. It, yeah. You know, it's not, it's not state. This is federal, low security federal, and people get hurt. But you know, I mean, I always say, look, if you get stabbed in prison, you probably had it coming. Like they're just not randomly stabbing people. Like you, well, you of, did something. A lot of my battle buddies are um, are COs or correction officers and stuff. You know, a lot of them or their cops. Yeah. And yeah, I get the stories, man. You know, and you 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 know, yeah, it's not state, but it's not exactly uh, it's not exactly like you're going to hang out at a at a local pub with friends either, you know? Right. So yeah, that would weigh on me. I give you a lot of credit. Well, um, so, so, uh, I, we, like I said, before we, I hit record, you know, we, we, uh, my wife and I watched the movie and I got a bunch of questions. What's so funny is, and I don't, you know, not trying to jinx this or anything, but what people that watch my channel find interesting and what I find interesting are sometimes two totally different things. Like I'll do, in, I'll do an interview with like a director or an actor or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you know, it'll get 8,000 views, you yeah. know? And then you, I'll do some guy who's been in two car chases <laughs> and just, just in a series of just knucklehead shit his whole life. And it'll get 45 or a hundred thousand views. And you're like, unbelievable. This guy's a complete derelict. And, exactly. but people, but he, you know, maybe he can tell stories or something, but, well, maybe, That's, maybe I walk the line with both. I don't know. It depends where yeah. the conversation goes. But I, I apologize to your audience if they're not. In, in no, no. But <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm saying is like I watched the movie and the whole time I was like, like, how did he do this on this budget? Like, like and, and, and it was a – it was set up well. The – I don't want to say it's um shoot. I, I used to know the term. It's like forecasting. Like you're the, you know, you leave a little crumb here, a little crumb there, like the very end. I'm not going to ruin the end, but like the end, like, you know, the end of it, I was like, Oh man. And even though you show the flashes, you didn't, I didn't really necessarily need the flashes from like how you got to that point. I was like, Oh, like I felt like something was up. I couldn't put my finger on it. And then when it happens, I was like, Damn. And you know, I, you're thinking one thing. I love that you were thinking one thing and it just completely went off. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of funny how that came together, man. Yeah. We call it the same thing as planting seeds and it's just enough to put in someone's psyche where their gut says something, but you don't want to listen to it. You kind of want to stay the course. And are you referring to, let's just say to not give anything away, the girlfriend or the yeah. thing on the boat? No, no, no. It was the, it was the, the, the girlfriend, the, the boat thing, I still wasn't 100%. I mean, I feel like I know who it was, but because I had never seen, I like, look, I've never seen your father in the film. I don't really re recall seeing him. Did you show him prior to that? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, then I missed that part. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, there was a slow push in when uh, my character was getting dressed, and then there was two pictures, and there was my character and his dad, and then the, the bastards. So, well, what's good is I hadn't seen, I didn't, re I don't recall seeing that. And I still put it together immediately. I was like, nice. oh, that's such and such. Oh, nice. so there's, so I guess, that, so there's, there's definitely two. Yeah. And really, the girlfriend was the one that really, you know, um, that's the one that really had me going, oh, wow. Oh, good, man. I'm glad I got you. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing, too, is you could have ended the film at about, there was about three or four different spots where I thought, Oh, it's about to end. Yeah. yeah. Any one of those would have been a good ending. You know, even though you may have, you may have felt like, Hey, I didn't. Yeah. But if I'd ended it there, I wouldn't have wrapped up. Yeah. You know, there would have been a few, a few loose ends, but I, I'm typically okay with you loose ends. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you'll fill those in on your, on your own, but yeah. Yeah. I hear you. You know, we're doing it and the, the story was kind of finding its way. I thought it was locked with the script, you know, and then you film and things change. And then when you're in edit, things change again. 
And uh, we're watching it, watching it. I'm like, I can't, I can't stop with this film. That's why I was so emphatic about, about making sure that this movie went as far as it is, because there's, there's no doubt that there's going to be a sequel. There's even someone approached me already about doing a, a series. Um, it just gets to a bigger story and I already have it in my head. It's already planned out and I didn't want to just end it with this. So we put a nice couple hooks on it and, uh, yeah, seem to, people seem to be responding, man. I, I'm kind of, I'm blown away. I didn't really, I didn't realize it would get this much attention. I didn't realize it. Uh, well, can, can we jump back to kind of the beginning? Like, you know, where, where you were, you know, how did you get into this? Like, where were you born? Were your parents in the industry? Cause it seems like you're from what I know from Tom, you know, your story, your life, I'd say your life track has gone in multiple different directions. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, were your parents in the industry? Did you always want to be in the industry because you no. were in the military? Like, it seems like I should. No, it's odd. I, I, I never thought I would be one. Um, I always knew something was in me. I, I just didn't know what the hell it was. I was a good athlete. I was never great. I was just really good. And but it never satisfied me. Nothing ever satisfied me. I was a wild kid, man. I was, I was an absolute maniac. Grew, grew up in Jersey at the Jersey Shore. My parents were from North Jersey. We lived down there. And uh, after high school, I joined the National Actually, I joined the Army National Guard when I was still a senior in high school. You know, when they're in the hallways and all the recruiters and everything. Right. So I was lost. I signed up. I didn't tell my parents. I just did it. And um, I went to boot camp and uh, came back and I started going to college trying all these things. I didn't know what, it, what, what would sing to me. I had no idea. So I just tried everything. Um, and I ended up taking an acting class on a whim outside of college and I was, holy shit, this is it. This is it. And I just, just literally left college the next day and just started going towards that. And I was getting in some trouble along the way. I wasn't, uh, well, can, can I ask you a question? Like an acting class, like, I mean, you must've had some inkling that it might be something you might want to do. It wasn't an odd uh, class to just randomly take. Like you, you had, did you, you know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't for me, it was different than most. Um, I can give a horse's ass about the spotlight and the Oscar and this and that. At that time in my life, I was buried deep in self-help books. Uh, I just didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know why I had this manic energy in me, this, this, this want for a, a high all the time. Um, I was fighting a lot, you know, like I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't get what I, what I wanted. I was never satisfied. And then I, 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 I read an acting book. My, I, I was a big fan of like film. I was, I just loved film growing up. It was my escape always just like anybody else, you know? And I had this book by Michael Caine and I, I bought it when I was in high school, just cause I liked Michael Caine. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll give this a shot. A friend of mine was going on an acting class and I said, I'll go with you. And I saw it. And I was just sitting in the uh, in the chairs watching everyone. I was like, I think I think this is it. And then I went up and did something, and something ended up coming out of me. This 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 I don't know what this this ball of contempt and fire and rage, and it just kind of exploded. And it felt so fucking good when I was done that I was like, I haven't felt like this. So I kept going, and I literally just stopped college and I just kept going, going, going. And that's how that's how it started. So. I mean, were you, did you go for acting, different yeah. acting? Were you think you were thinking acting or were you thinking? Yeah, I didn't audition or anything for about a year and a half. I just knew it served as, <clears throat> excuse me, almost a therapy for me um, at that time in my life. So I just, it was, you know, acting, true acting is, is the uh, art of, of, you know, self-exploration and knowing yourself. So really digging into that world, that craft is kind of what opened me up and made me realize a lot of things about myself, what made me tick and um, why I have these, you know, these, these, crazy things going on in my head. Uh, but creatively it, it, it satisfied me and I just kept going with it, kept going with it. And then I started auditioning. I learned how to do that. And then I started booking work. Um, I was lucky. I just started booking work quick. And within two years I had a, I had stuff going on, you know, it just worked. And then somehow or another, I ended up booking the Sopranos at that time. And when I booked the Sopranos, I did a, you know, a couple episodes in season four. If you blink, you miss it. You know, they always cut a lot of stuff out and everything and right. whatever. It was still cool to get on. But you know something? I didn't even watch the show. So more other everyone around me, kind of like what you were saying before, was like so into it. Like, oh, wow, this, that. And I was like, thanks, thanks, thanks. But I was kind of like this. I didn't see what the big deal was. I, I still went to acting class and was 
finding my way at the same time, even though I was booking work. So I did the show and then there was a hiatus, did some more work. And then uh, they called me up to come back in the fifth season. I was supposed to be Christopher's right hand man. And one of the guys under Christopher. And at that time I got a call for, uh, I got a call from the National Guard unit. And there's like this saying when you join the military is like a code, you know, if you get a phone call and this is, this is said, you'll know what that means. And I, for the life of me, I forget what it was, <laughs> but I got the call. And, uh, and in the guard, it's very, it's not like, yes, Sergeant, no, sir. It's, that's not the guard. The guard's really loose, you know, as all yeah. my buddies I've known. So I got a call and I remember my phone rang back when you have answering machines and I hear specialist Interdonato. And I looked at the number. I say, hey, Frank, what's going on? Specialist Kevin Interdonato. I'm like, Frank, it's me. What's up? And then he <laughs> said, what he said. I was like, oh, shit. He said, did you receive this transmission? I said, yeah, I received, Sarge. And he hung up. I'm like, wow, I'm going to fucking war. And uh, that was it. I got uh, another phone call after that. And they said, you can't accept employment from this date on, which was like three or four weeks from that point. I got the phone call. And uh, you go on active duty status. And that was it. You know, I couldn't uh, work. Lost the Sopranos, lost everything. I had a couple of films lined up and, and that was that. But you know something, Matt, I didn't, to be honest with you, I was just going to say, how did you, how did that, how did that feel? Would you feel like, I didn't, I didn't, at that time in my life, I was a fucking nut. Even though I was still going through what I was going through, I, I, I had a, I had a fire in me, man, that I couldn't, I couldn't put out if I tried. And um, looking back at it now, after going through the experience I had, it sounds very naive and foolish and ignorant, but I was the prime kind of guy to go to war at that time in my life. So we went there and um, I was a National Guard unit and we were field artillery, which was a combat unit. Um, so there was no females in my unit. It was all a bunch of guys from Jersey. We got picked. There's some of it of, of a draft from four different units. And when we went to Baghdad, uh, I was one of eight military police companies. So there were all military police there and they took our field artillery unit and they converted us to military police before we went out because there was a shortage proper train up to be military police in the army, I believe is five or six months. We went to Fort Dix for five weeks, did the best we could. Didn't shoot half the weapons, didn't know half the shit. And then they just kind of shipped us out there, went to Kuwait city to acclimate. And before you know it, we were driving in a convoy at like 3 AM to Baghdad. And, um, that was like Mad Max, man. Back that back that when I was there, that was, that was like, that was, that was war when I was there. It was a little different. Um, there's fires in the sky. The sky was orange. It was like, you smelled like shit. And then, um, the first month was a little quiet. And then that was that man, all hell broke loose. So they put our company into, a into a Is this desert, desert storm or Iraqi no, freedom, it's, uh, uh, Iraqi freedom. Okay. 2004. Um, so we went there and of the eight active duty MP companies, we were, we were considered one of them. We were the only one with that was all males because police or military police, there's females. So someone high up figured this maniac group of guys from New Jersey in the national guard that were field artillery, they're all guys. So we'll put them into Seder city, which is kind of the ghetto of Baghdad at the time. And, um, everyone else had armored Humvees. They rolled out these, we had non-armored, no floors, plastic doors, no doors. And, um, we rolled out and we sometimes we had to figure out on the spot how to use certain weapons. And um, it was it was uh, it was it was insane. It was absolutely insane. It still not seems a, like a bad dream. I'm still dealing with things today. It's not worth getting into. But uh, somehow I luck another I, I lucked out. You know, we lost a few guys. Almost everybody got hit and uh, made it back. And that was it. How long were you uh, stationed there? My company Boy. was there for 12 months. I came home in 10. I ended up breaking my leg when I was there. That was, um, okay. I, I, it's so funny, man. You get sniped, shot, blown up, all these close calls, and I ended up breaking my leg uh, wrestling with my buddy one night. <laughs> okay. um, I figured. So you come back, and two days later, your uncle stops by. I was like, where the fuck am I? It was, it was uh, such a mind trip. It was so wound tight. It almost made me feel how tight I was wound because over there I felt normal. You have to have such a heightened sense of uh, fight or flight, you know, which is what I 
thought of when when you're you know when I I knew you're in prison and I had never been locked up like that and I can only imagine the anxiety I would have in that situation. But I mean, it's the same thing. You you very quickly, just like you know, I hate to even compare the two, but you know, you very quickly get used to it. You do. You know? The first week or two, it's it. You're you're looking around. You're you're nervous. You're uncomfortable. Yeah. Two you know two weeks later, you're way better. A month later, you're shooting the shit with people. You know three week three months later, you know you're playing pranks on fucking guys that ha- that have <laughs> that have just got out of the state prison for murder. You know, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, you know, you're eating with guys that have you know killed four people or you know and just you know and. They're like, oh yeah, old man Jim. He's he's all right. They're like, yeah, you you know he's got a life sentence in the state. Right <laughs> right? Like, you know he's oh he's fine. You know, um, but yeah, you you get used to it. And people are people. You know, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they've uh, most of the guys that. Well, I'd say most of the guys that are locked up are you know, a lot of them are just you know scumbags. But you know, for the most part, a, a lot of them were just in bad positions. They did, they, they didn't like, look, most people, you know, they go right back to what they feel comfortable with, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Like that, that's how you're going to, you know, they get out and they recidivate because, because when they get anxious and they're desperate, they go, you go back to what you know. So yeah. next thing you know, they're walking into a bank and saying, give me the money or they're, they're meeting their buddy and saying, you know, I need some money. And the guy says, well, I can, I can, give you some, some dope to sell. And yeah, you know, where the average person would think, you know, I'm going to work two jobs. I'm going to cut my bills. I'm going to this, but that's not really in there. That's not in the wheelhouse. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. But yeah, you do, you get used to it just like you said. And then when you leave, you feel super uncomfortable Yeah, and you, and I look back now and think when I left some of the things that I did and the way I behaved, I'm like, boy, you must've sounded like a maniac, but it made sense. At the time, I, I give you a funny example. Yeah. Is um, I worked at a gym, mm-hmm. and anybody who's listened to my channel before has probably heard this story. <laughs> but I, I I worked at a gym, and you know I was in the halfway house, and they give you a bag of lunch, right? They give you, you know, whatever it's peanut butter and jelly or bologna or something. They give you like you get like a bag of chips. Mm-hmm. So they give it to me, and I'm eating it. Now I'm trying to save every dime I can because I got out of prison with virtually nothing. Right, right. So you know when everybody's going ordering lunch. You know, I'm like, oh, no, no, I got a bag of lunch. Well, after a couple of weeks of working at this job, this one woman, her name was Leanne. Leanne goes, Matt, you're always eating like bol- the bologna sandwich. She's like, why don't you just, she's, she's look, I'll, I'll buy you. And she goes, why don't you just order lunch? And I go, because I'm trying to save money and, you know, and that's, that's eight or 10 bucks and, and I've got a bag of lunch and it's free and I'm okay with bologna. I've been eating bologna for 13 years. I'm good. <laughs> and, and she goes, and she said, I'll buy you lunch. And I went. I'm good. She goes, no, Matt, I'll, I'll pay for lunch. And I looked at her and keep in mind, there's four or five people standing around, like looking like, yeah. and I looked at her, I went, but this is my mentality from being in prison. And I went, Leanne, I said, if you want to buy me lunch out of the goodness of your heart, but you never expect for me to reciprocate, if you're thinking in a week from now, Matt will get paid and he'll give me the money back or Matt will in two weeks from Matt. Now Matt's probably going to buy me lunch. I said, let me make it perfectly clear. I said, I will never reciprocate. There will never be a time when I'm going to buy you lunch or I will pay you back. So if you're doing this, it's out of the goodness of your own heart because you genuinely just want to buy me lunch. I said, you will never be repaid back. I said, if that is why you're buying it, I said, that's fine. If not, I said, it's no big deal. I've got a bologna and I like it. And she looked at me and everybody's like, and she went, I'm going to get you lunch. (laughs) I'm going to write that down, man. I got to put that somewhere. That was great. But think about it. In prison, you don't borrow anything uh-huh, uh-huh. from somebody. You don't run up debt. You don't. And that's how, how it is. It's like, you know, maybe if you, you know, your buddy next to you, you know, he gives you coffee sometimes. And maybe you get coffee. It's like, there's little things. But that's because I know this guy. Right, right. And somebody comes to you first and says, hey, man, do you want this? No. Even if I need it. You know, you just don't want to run up debt and I want people feeling obligated to me. And I certainly don't want to run up a debt that I can't pay. Yeah. Because yeah. that's how you get yourself stabbed. Sure. Sure, man. I can understand. Yeah. So, when you came, when you came out, if you don't mind me asking, were you, um, were you just as driven of an individual before you went in or more or less? No, I was way more disciplined and way more dr- driven when I came out. Yeah. Like going to the gym in the morning now is a struggle. Yeah. Um, where before, 
I was just programmed. Like the guards turn on the the lights at like four in the morning. You get up, you get your coffee, you go get your stuff, you use the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you come back, you wait in your cell to be counted. Then you get up and you go stand by the door so you can go get lunch for breakfast. It's one of the most decent meals of the day. Then you go to the gym. And I was just, you know, you're on autopilot, but after being out here this long, like it's so soft out here, bro. Like people don't have any idea how good they have it. So, you know, now I like I'm laying in bed at four o'clock. I still wake up then, but I'm laying there. I'm like, God, I don't want to go to the gym. Yeah. God, I don't want to do. Oh, this is horrible. Yeah. For the probably until about a year ago, I never had downtime. There was always something to do. Yeah. I could be writing. I could be researching. I could be working on this. I could be something to do last year or so, man, I'm so disgusted with myself because there are times I just dick around, do nothing. I, I, I haven't done that in a while. I, I know what you mean. I, I, I get it. I'm actually looking forward to that. But that's a sense of accomplishment too, though, man. I mean, if you get to that place, I mean, we always say like, you know, work smarter, not harder. My father always said to me, the strong take from the weak and the smart take from the strong. And and it's it's funny. That's you know, a because, great thing. Yeah, he always said that to me. And I always had that in my head, you know, because we always try to be strong, strong, strong. And it's like, well, my fucking back hurts, man. You know, like, you know, I grew up doing construction, my brother, family business. And after a while I had to re kind of evaluate and I'm sure maybe you, you doing, you've done this too. It's like, I can't work any harder. I've done the whole, I'll outwork anybody in the room. I've, I've been through that. I don't know about you, but I mean, to the point where I got myself sick, I could stay up 72 hours and crank. I know I can, I've done it, but you get sick and, and, you, and it just fucks everything up. And you're like, man, I gotta be smarter about this, you know? So in a way, I'm kind of happy you feel weird about yourself because it's kind of a good position to be in, man. If you can conduct business and and take a step back and not have to crank like that, yeah, I think you're in a better spot than not, you know? You know, I, I mean, it's, it's like I'm still working 40, 50 hours a week, but yeah, I, yeah. Was working, I was working 70, 80 hours a week. Yeah. And, and my wife will tell you that you're working, you're always ready to work. You're always working. You're always on your phone. You're answering comments. You're doing this. You're talking to this person. You're scheduling meetings. You're doing this. And it's like, yeah, but I'm doing that while I'm watching a movie. Yeah. 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 I know. So, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, well, I'll have two hours between, between this podcast and maybe, and another podcast, you know, yesterday I scheduled all day, but I'm sat on the couch scheduling, you know, (laughs) <laughs> it, it, so I, I feel like, you know, I know, like, I know it feels weird. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know it. I hear you, man. I hear you. I, I got I ordered one of those stand up desks recently because just the thought, the idea of sitting and doing something, whether it's a chair, this, that, it's like, I got to, I got to go, you know, I got to, I like, keep telling myself I'm going to do that when I, when, as soon as this, when I move, we buy a house and we, you know, I'm still on probation for another four months, but we're going to buy a house. And then I keep telling myself, I'm going to buy one of those. Yeah. I do. I sit down all day. It sucks. I know it's weird, right? Uh, I hunch. Oh, you have a walking oh. tread. You have a um the walker treadmills Is at that- the gym. Sorry, a desk treadmill. It's one that has no. It's just it's just a platform on the bottom. It slides underneath between uh, under your desk. Mm-mm. Yeah, Mm-mm. my brother just got one. He's got a stand up desk. You pull it right out. You just you remote control. You turn it on. It just starts. The belt starts going, and you walk while you work. Man, that yeah, right. I'm like, that's oh, a great idea. That's a great idea <laughs> because I'll tell you something else, and this is horrible too. I can't. I'm, I don't give a fuck. Um, like literally, I got up to like right now. I'm 170, right? Mm-hmm. I was one, uh, like 188, probably 190, but whatever, 188, 189, and like I was because I don't do it. I sit sit around. I work out in the morning, but working out for 30, 45 minutes is and then doing nothing all day yeah. and then eating normal. Yeah. yeah. Right. No. And I'm, I'm tiny, you know, I'm five foot six. So I don't, you know, I don't burn off anything. So I started taking and I fucking, I wish my wife was here. She'd tell me what it was, but I started taking a, went to the, you know, I take TRT. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Cause I'm old. I'm breaking <laughs> it all over. So, you know, I'm trying to fight, you know, age as much as possible. So I started taking TRT and that's when I started gaining weight because I started getting, I'm just hungry all the time. Oh yeah. So then I gained, so I, like I said, I gained like 20 pounds. And then, so then I went back to the doctor. I said, bro, you got to give me something. Like, I don't want to get off the TRT and you got to give me something. My appetite, I'm starving all the time. Mm -hmm. 
And so he gave me, there's some shot, I forget the name of is it. Is it like Ozempic or something like yes, that? Yes, but, it, but it's, it's not Ozempic, but it's, it's like an off brand of it. Yeah, there's like three or four different kinds of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Listen. Works, huh? Almost 20 pounds. Wow. And really, to be honest, it's really is 20 pounds because I was like 168, 169 a couple of days ago. Wow. You know, but yeah, I mean, that's how bad it is. It's like, and I shouldn't be able to be doing that. I should be more disciplined, but I'm also hungry in a way that I've just, and it's snacking all day long. And it's just, yeah, there's only so there, you can only be so disciplined. I think everyone has a vice. Hopefully some vices are not as bad as the other, but you know, you see so many people on social media telling, telling other people how to be and what to do and all that stuff. And it's like, come on with all this crack of shit, you know, hey, um, I smoked for a long time. I, I recently just quit smoking. Thank God. And for people to say, Oh man, you've been through this and you've done that and you're dedicating your discipline, this and that. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I just can't get it. I can't do it. And he said, kill me, my ego that I just couldn't stop this little fucking cigarette. And you know what? I didn't quit. I actually just got tired of it. So I don't get and give myself credit for quitting. I'm like, eh, I'm done. This shit stinks. You know what I mean? I just stopped. Right. You know? Uh, and it's, it's, it was unfortunate, but, um, yeah, I hear what you're saying, man. It does get it does get tougher. You know why I don't use the um, TRT? And a lot of people in my business, I mean, almost all use it. Right. I don't use it because I'm scared of what would happen if I stopped. Um, it kind of freaks me out because I think it'd be like, you tell me. I mean, if, if you stopped, what would happen to your body, to your men mentality? Of, um, I, well, first of all, how old are you? 44. Yeah, you're you're well, I don't know. You're you're at that point where your testosterone starts to drop. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, I'm bro, I'm I'm 54 years old. I'm going to be a few months from now I'll be 55. You're 54. I know. I'm gorgeous. I know. You're but, a gorgeous man, Matthew Cox. Wow. You're 54? <laughs> you look younger than me, man. Holy shit. Well, listen, I've a lot of the wow. The money I spent I I stole from the banks. I I used to. <laughs> this is yeah, this is this is a nose job, a, a facelift. I've got two hair tra hair grafts. I've, I've done a lot. The teeth, you know, I did a lot. Like I spent that money. I didn't save any of it, but I did spend some of it. Right? Good for you. Good so, for you. you know, That's liposuction. Cool. Like there's, there's some, there's been some work. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, so I was going to the gym and it was really mostly the gym. I was going to the gym and I was just like, like I'm making no gains and I'm, yeah. and I'm not, and I'm sore. And I'm yeah, not I noticed, yeah, sore, man. It, yeah. And then I also started noticing I would bang into something and there'd be a bruise there. Mm. And there'd be a bruise there a week later. Mm. And I'm like, what? Like I barely bumped into that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you're like, okay, bro, you're you're like 50. By that point, I was like 53 years old or something. I only had been on it like a year or so. And I was like, bro, it's yeah. and then I had a guy come on that did uh, TRT. He, he was a steroid, a uh, big time steroid guy, got mm -hmm. caught, went to prison, came out and started a, a TRT replaced, you know, whatever, uh, a clinic. Yeah. And I told him what was going on. He's like, Oh bro. He's like, you, you gotta go get your blood work. Wow. He's like, and you know, I did, he's like, you're going to feel better all the way around. Like everything you're going to feel more, um, more energetic. You're going to yeah. sleep better. You're going to, and everything you said was right. The problem was the worst thing. The only, like I said, the only bad thing was I'm starving. Uh, I'm hungry. I'm just, I was hungry all the, now I'm not, yeah. that's another drug. So right, you know, right. I see. I don't want to be that guy to take fucking, you're taking 10 pills a day. Like, I don't want to be that guy, but yeah, yeah. I I'm hear sure. you, man. I hear you. Yeah. Tired this and that and <clears throat> everything. I, I find myself working out as much as, as much as possible. And I still box. I still spar with a bunch of guys and I fought back in the day for a brief period. Um, and I find that the more I stay active and work out, the less sore I, I get. If I take off a week, you know, or whatever, if I just need to recoup and get back on the trail. Whew, oh, it's horrible. I'm fucking die, first man. Back. Oh my God. Yeah. So I'm like, I just got to stick with this shit yeah. now. It's boring. But I, I don't know what would happen if I stopped. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I would just think I would just kind of revert back to, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Hopefully I don't have to. Oh man. That's but I look at these guys like, you know, look at you look at Sylvester Stallone and you look at Arnold Schwarzenegger and you look at Brad Pitt and you yeah. like so they're all on stuff like they and they all look amazing. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna push the envelope as much as I can. Yeah. For as long as I can. Yeah, they 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 have to, you know what I mean? It's it's a uh, it's they, they made a business out of these things, their looks or the physique and, and things like that. You right. Know? 
it's uh, it's 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 a wild business, and the demand to to maintain that too, you know. Right. So they're stars, well, man. Stars are different. Stars are, you know, I know a couple stars, and and um, stars are one of two things: either they are very very smart individuals, or they have very very smart individuals around them. Because to be a star, you have to maintain stardom, and I know people that had it and then went away from it. And they're in a much happier place once they realize what it is. You know, it takes effort to, to maintain that. It takes right. effort. And some people like that shit, man. I, you know, I don't, it freaks me out. You know what I mean? Really freaks me out uh, thinking about that. But, well, I have a, a, a question. So when yeah. you got, let me just, just to jump back on, when you got out of the military, mm -hmm. what did you think? Is that the right way to say it or National Guard? You're still in the National Guard when you got back from deployment. Well, yeah, I was Guard, but I was, uh, you're considered active when you're there. You know what I mean? So right. when I got so, back home, when I, and that was it, I was, I was stop law. So my enlistment was actually up before the war, but they wouldn't let me get out because the war was coming. Right. So, uh, yeah, when I got out of the, when I was done with the war, I was, I was out of the military completely. So what did you, what was your thought process then? What were you thinking? I'm going, I'm going to stick with the acting. I'm going to yeah. keep hammering away. Yeah. Cause I jumped right back into it. The first month I was there, we just pulled tower duty and ride alongs and stuff with the company we were replacing. And there was a lot of downtime. So I actually wrote a script while I was there. And, um, then, then shit just hit the fan and you know, I had a, I, I couldn't be that guy anymore. So when I came home, I jumped right back into being an actor again and uh, I gave it about two, three months and it was just way too early. I wasn't, I wasn't right. I wasn't ready. I didn't laugh at the same things I was laughing at. I didn't cry at the same things I was crying. It was just, everything was just off. I remember I took all my clothes out of my closet and I literally just threw everything in one of those donation bins, you know, and uh, I dipped into the money I had saved from war. All, all $29,000 I made in a year of, of being in war, which is cool. Um, I bought all new wardrobe and everything because I just didn't feel like I fit in those clothes anymore. It wasn't me. It just wasn't me. So like there's this like effort to get back to who you were and, and that just doesn't happen. You just have to kind of accept who you are and then just take this path and figure things out. So not to be long winded, I, I jumped in. Uh, it just, it just wasn't right. And I actually took a year off and just worked. I just worked and went back to construction. My dad, I just worked, found my way. Um, I was writing a lot, a lot and, uh, slowly but surely I said, okay, I'm ready to do it again. So I started from scratch. I started community theater, like from, from zero student films, short films, little parts on TV. And then after about two, three years, it started building up and surpassed where I was prior. Yeah. Okay. So still, so how, how long was it until you made, uh, the bastard sons? Oddly enough, the bastard sons was a script that I auditioned for back when I was 28 years old, when I lived in Jersey at the time, uh, some young kid at the time, Glenn Rodriguez, real talented guy auditioned me. I got the part funding fell through. And uh, we ended up just making a short film together, working together throughout the years. That was 2008. I moved to LA in 2010. Glenn ended up moving out and around a year later, we worked more together. Seven years later, I came back to New Jersey. He went North Carolina and then fast forward to when COVID hit and um, got But out. you're working, you're working the whole time. Working, yeah, until COVID. And my wife's an actress too. So, you know, our careers are, our lifestyles are like this, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Sometimes you get paid well, sometimes you don't. You get, we got to figure things out. And, and um, it's a very insecure lifestyle. You know, we're, we're consistently unemployed. You know, yeah. it feels when you have a job, right? Like that, that, that feeling, like, you know, and you got to find work, got to find work. That, that's an actor. Like you're always hungry for work. So you get side jobs and things that you can hustle with. So when COVID hit, we were in an okay spot. I was working, Amanda was working. And um, once COVID hit, I was like, oh shit. And we just had a baby, like she was like three months old, four months old at the time. So, you know, that that dude in us, you know what I mean? I was like, well, fuck this, you know, by hook or by crook, I know COVID's gonna end. So I called up my buddy Glenn. I said, what's up with that script from 15 years ago? 
because it was about these five guys that were like low level criminals and there was a girlfriend involved and it was bad. It was, it was written by a 17 year old kid at the time. He was a young kid, you know? Right. So I said, Glenn, let me, let me, let me write a movie. Let me write a new movie, but I want to take the concept of these five guys and, and do my thing. I just have this story brewing in my head and my mind tends to go with, with crime. And I did and rewrote it. And then that was the bastard son. So it actually started, was derived from a story 15 years prior. And that was it. I ended up writing two more screenplays over COVID and somehow or another matter, all three movies got made. I don't know how the fuck that happened, but it, but it did. And what were the other ones? One was another one was called malicious. That was like a thriller horror film. That one is popping too, man. Uh, it's one of the most popular horror films on, on Tubi for like the past two months. And then the third one's called St. Michael of the city that's getting released in April. What is that one about? Uh, small story. Uh, guy comes back into town after seven years. We're not sure why, but he gets hooked up with his old crew that he used to work with doing some, uh, you know, unsavory things and he gets sucked into the life. And then it turns out there's a big twist why he's back in town. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, it's funny cause the, uh, you would, if you hadn't mentioned this to me on the phone, I would have never noticed with What's the, that? um, bastard sons that, that, um, uh, that you never mentioned the mob, like you just never say, but the whole time you feel like this is, or it's definitely, it's organized crime, but I, you know, well, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get that. It was, I didn't think mob. I just thought organized crime. Good. Um, and so, you know, but when you mentioned it, yeah, you, you never mention any of those things. You just right. automatically assume all of that. Yeah. And had, had you not said that I probably would have said, Oh, it's a mob movie. Mm -hmm. But you guys never say the mob. And and then, of course, the characters, none of these guys, it, it, you know, you've got there's a couple black guys. They're like they're they're, they're uh, what? I don't know if you're Italian or like nobody. You don't it, they don't seem all Italian. No, no. Uh, I mean, I'm, I I am Italian. Um, okay. My buddy Joe Cernio is Italian. Frankie's a mix. Uh, Kirk, he played Marco. He's a mix. Malik's, you know, black. I mean, it's 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 kind of like. Um, you know, people I grew up with. So it felt real to me, you know, uh, right. especially in the military. Like it was just so many people I was around that were different, different walks of life, different everything. So um, I was like, well, I want to write a story that makes sense to me. And I don't want to do anything cliche. I don't want to do anything that's a stereotype because I don't think like that. I just like real, real honest behavior. So I just had these circumstances and raised the stakes. And the movie only takes place over a day, really. You know, it's... Uh, one crazy day, but, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how we, how I approached it and just put, put these, these individuals into a high stakes situation just to see how it would play out. But I don't like the idea of throwing stuff in people's faces. I, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt when they're watching a film and let them think a little bit. And, um, I didn't want to do anything, you know, the gangs of New Jersey or bada bing, bada yeah. boom. Like, you know what I mean? I'm Italian. I'm from Jersey. I didn't grow up like that. I got, you know, hardcore North Italian uh, uh, relatives, but you know, that, that I think now, Matt, even though I grew up with some people like that, today's day and age, the younger generation, they may look at that as caricatures rather than real people. You know, I know a couple of young kids that watched, tried watching the Sopranos are laughing their asses off the, their asses off the whole time where those are real dudes to me, but oh, yeah. to them, they're like characters. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I've been, I'm lo I was locked up with those guys. You know, <laughs> exactly, and it's, and it's funny when they start talking. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh my god, right? This right. is how he really talks. Yeah. Like this is how they really <laughs> do. They behave exactly like that. Yeah, like like straight out of Central Casting. Right, right, right. It's true, man. And I grew up with fellas like that too. You know, and I know them well. But I just wanted to make something that was real to me, and. um I could have went another way with it too. And I'm glad I stuck to my guns on it because if I was so focused on, on the industry and Hollywood and whatnot, that, that, that movie bastard sons would have taken a different turn. I could have made something a little bit more artistic um, and, and went the Sundance route and went that route with it. But I made that movie for the people that I know and for me too. And the movie, the kind of movies I like to see and, you know, my friends and my family like to see. And I said, well, I'm going to satisfy that. You know, the, the artsy fartsy stuff. It's not my nature to make it. 
I could have made the choice to make it to satisfy industry stuff. But uh, when I hit that crossroads, I just kind of stayed, stayed the course and trusted my gut. I'm glad I did. Yeah, it, it was, it was definitely good. It was, and I, you know, so I don't know if you know this, but I, I like when I was locked up, I, I wrote a bunch of, I wrote several books and I wrote about around 23, 24, um, synopses of guys' stories. And, and some, some of those synopses became the books. So I shouldn't oh, say yeah. it's not like that plus books It's some of them, you wrote the synopsis, the synopsis. And then it was like, there's so much information here. That's you know, <laughs> so and you went ahead and I went ahead and said, okay, well this, like the synopsis is 15,000 words. Oh my God. I might as well blow this up into a book. Like yeah. I've already got, I just have to, you know, you're, when you're having such a problem condensing things, it's like, you know, I don't have to, I, I'm going to condense it for this purpose, but now I'm just going to go ahead and write how the whole blown out scene after scene. And it ends up being, you know, 50, 60,000 or 80,000 or 90,000 words. And so you end up with a 300 page book or a 250 page book. And so I ended up getting a couple of guys in a Rolling Stone magazine and we optioned the life rights to the story. Right. So while I'm in prison, by the way. So, and you can imagine how working in prison is, I, I have. How the hell did you manage that, man? I have a pad. Yeah. And I sit down with the guy and I write the notes. And then I order a Freedom of Information Act to get all of his legal documents and get his, you know, from the FBI or DEA, whoever. Right. And so you get, you get a thick thing in, it takes two or three months, you get it in. And now the things that he doesn't know, you know, I do know. So it's like, he's like, you know, I don't know, a couple of weeks later we got arrested and I don't really know why, uh, I don't know how they got to that. And well, now I get the documents three months later, two months later, and I walk and I say, boom, did you know a guy named Pookie? And they're like, yeah. Okay. Well, Pookie and this guy, you know, Ruru robbed a 7-Eleven. <laughs> Pookie turned on him, blah, blah, you know, and then talked to the FBI or talked to the, whatever the cops. And then he said he knew a guy that was selling drugs and he could set him up. And that guy is you, is this your phone number? And they're like, Oh my God, you know? And then, so you tell them what happened, but now I know how they got on to you. And so I get a more 360 degree viewpoint yeah. point of view from, of the story. And I end up writing a story and you know, you, you obviously you play up certain things, you play down certain, because it's true crime, because it's real. Right. You know, I can't, you know, you can't make it up. So you have to, you got to go with, which in, in some ways is so much easier. Yeah. 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 Um, because I don't have to create this story where there's double crosses and these guys are double crossing each other anyway. So you just have to play up the, you know, the basic characters, like what makes him sympathetic? Well, what's going to make people root for him? You talk to him about his childhood. Next thing you know, he's talking about, you know, they don't, and these guys have no clue. Right. They're talking about their, you know, their mom was a prostitute. Their dad was in and out of jail. He used to beat his mom. The, the new drug dealer boyfriends would beat the mother. Um, he just eventually be, had a hatred toward, toward drug dealers. But then again, he wasn't capable of doing anything other than because he grew up anything other than being in crime because he and his brother grew up in the projects and so they, at an early age, they dropped out of school and they started after stealing a car, they ended up robbing drug dealers and they just continued to do it. And then one of their childhood friends, and I'm like, yeah, but how did you know what drug dealers had money? Cause you guys are stealing 10 keys. Like that's not a normal drug dealer that you're still getting a $200,000 in cash. Like, how do you even know? Oh, well, one of the guys we grew up with became a sheriff and he became the head of the task force, the drug task force in our town. <laughs> Holy shit. Do you see what I'm saying? The next thing you know, you're like for two guys that had a decent story about two brothers robbing drug dealers just fucking turned into training day. Did you write this? Oh yeah. It's, it's a great story. And both the brothers are actually out of prison. They're maniacs. Um, but so yeah, I, you know, and so I, I have all these, had all these stories. So I started optioning them and I got a book deal, a couple book deals when I was locked up and I got yeah. advances. You know, it's funny because like the advance was like thirty five hundred bucks, but thirty five hundred bucks in prison. Yeah, my gosh. Yeah, I'm I'm a millionaire. I believe it, man. I believe so, it. So that's what I did while I was in prison, and then when I got out, I started optioning those stories. Yeah, and, you know, they're not they're not getting made. But but what happens is it's great when you've you've optioned something six years ago. And every 18 months, you get a check for seven or eight grand. They for want to be up, right? Yeah. yeah. That's great. 
can buy my wife an engagement ring. <laughs> um, you know, <clears throat> so, you know, and I'm working with, you know, different people, but I, I know it's gotta be like, I can only imagine how, fr how frustrated you like the, the story about the guy from 15 years ago, like how many projects uh, start and they got to, it's funny. I always make fun of the guys when they call me, the producers that call me and said, want to talk to me about this. I'm the, oh, okay. Okay. I understand. Well, you know, we, this, we, that. I'm like, look, look, I know how it goes. Yeah, yeah. You're, you want to know if I'm interested, I'm interested. You want to know if the life rights are available. They are, you're going to talk to your, your, your team. Uh, then we're going to have another meeting. Then you're going to talk to Brad. Then Jennifer is on vacation for that takes two weeks. Yeah. When she gets back. We have to talk to Tom. You've already talked to Jill at Netflix. And then, so I said, in four months from now, you will send me something that says you want to option it for 18 months. And then when I'm going to say, well, how much is the option? You're going to say, well, we don't really pay for options. And I'm going to say, you're full of shit because I option shit all the time. So people do pay for options. I was optioning stuff in prison and I'm <laughs> optioning stuff now. So it's before so we get to that, so I tell them all that you could tell they're just That's like, great. You know, yeah, like, I'm, I'm on the same page with you because like you said, yeah, the ups and downs, uh, I, I, I've had so many, as sure as many people have, I'm not going to say I got better at taking them. I think I just got numb. So the highs don't hit me as much anymore, but neither do the lows. And I just kind of stay steady and that's all I similar. Yeah. So similar to what you're saying and how you explain it to them, I found myself the past couple of years saying to people, um, you know, this and that, the other thing, can we just fast forward right to the end? Let's, yeah. let's just get right there because I don't have time for this little shit. You know, right. about, you're, you know? uh, this is my, you're so talented. You're so amazing. You're, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I already believe all that. Okay. Please don't tell me how wonderful I am. <laughs> you're, you're wasting the 10 minutes. Yeah, man. So. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny what takes, what it takes to get there. Um, and it took, it took what it took, you know, my mentality is different just like yours is too. And 10, five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, you just kind of go farther, but I find uh, myself and I think you can attest to this as well. I make decisions a lot faster now. Maybe I trust my gut a little bit more and uh, even in myself. And instead of letting things go, go, go a little farther, if I get that one little feeling, I'm like, yeah, something's up, you know, and I got to be good with it, make peace with it rather than being desperate for it. It's part of the reason why I started making movies, man. Um, I, I, I got so fed up being an actor. Uh, I've been very fortunate to play, uh, leads and, and main supportings in, in a lot of independent film. And it's just absolutely, uh, crushing when you do, you give so much of yourself as, as a creative, and then you get in the movie theater and you're watching it on the big screen and you're like, and you just want to like hide your fucking head cause it sucks. And I went through that so many times and I'm like, I can't keep giving people all of me and not I, I, at least be good. Can I tell right. my mom about it? You know, I'd like to post it on social media and, and it's like hit or miss one, one dime a dozen. And I'm like, I can't take this anymore, man. And coming from a family construction business, I was kind of geared that way. Anyway, I was fighting it. So when I moved out to Los Angeles, I made up my mind, I was going to learn how to make a movie. And I actually reached out to a lot of distribution companies and foreign sales reps that sold movies that I was the lead in. So I don't see actors, I never saw actors doing that. And I'm like, you know what, let me, let me give this a go, man. So I'd pick up the phone and, hey, Jones, oh, this is Kevin Interdonato. I played, you know, Frank and Bad Frank or this or that. I'm like, hey, what's up, Kevin? How you doing? I'm like, good, good, good. I said, you know, I want to thank you for putting the movie out. It really bumped my career up. Dude, I never thought, it was like, it was like a kid getting a, a present at Christmas. Distributors never get calls from actors. So for me to say that, the first time I did it, I'm like, hmm. I think I got something here. So, you know, a bottle of wine and a visit in person speaks volumes. And I did. And I started calling up more and more and more. You know, fast forward five years. Now I have all these relationships with distribution companies and foreign sales reps. And as an actor now playing a lead from these, especially these recent films, my value has gone up, but I can also sell any movie that I'm in. And right. I sell friends films too. And I don't take money for that crap. I like paying it forward. It's hard enough, you know? So, uh, yeah, I kind of enabled myself. I'm like, if I'm going to make movies of my own, I'm going to have the end in mind. I'm not just going to write it and then be like, good, good luck. See what happens. I'm mean, before I put pen to paper, I'm like, I know what's going to happen. And I'm going to rewind about two years from then and start now. 
and that's what I did with all three. And that's how all three got made and all three got distribution and that the next one in October. Yeah. That like, I'm at the point where I feel like, like really I've got kind of one last ditch effort. Um, for what? Yeah. Well, because I just had a, a, a company just optioned like 12 of my stories. Wow. Um, actually they're reading, they've read them over before, but now they're reading out over them individually to say like this one, and I'm supposed to have a meeting next week at, where they're saying, you know, they're going to break them down over the course. They said, look, we're going to have to talk for like an hour or two. Cause we're going to go through each one. And we're going to say, okay, this one will both these two people, you know, will they option their life? Right. Right. And will they, are they willing to do a documentary? You know, yes. Okay. Will this guy do a documentary? No, he's incarcerated and he wouldn't anyway. Okay. So this one's more of a series. Yes. Okay. This one. So they're going to break down each one so that they know where to pitch it. Cause it's a, it's a production company that wants to go out and pitch them all. Okay. Now, I also just optioned my personal life rights. It's a, for, it's not to cut you off. It's a production company that wants to pitch to, to producers to make it. Well, yes. Yeah, some of them, they're going to do themselves. They currently have eight true crime series out there right now. Wow. Like they're, they're producing eight of like, they can't do 12. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So obviously they're going to try and turn around. They're going to try and, you know, flip yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but some of them, they're going to cherry pick. I'm sure like, Hey, we can do these two, but right. that's it. Right. You know, you know how it is. Most of them, are, even big production companies can all, they, they have a bandwidth. Sure. So, sure. um, but, and then I have a couple other, my, my stuff that I haven't optioned yet that I kind of held back, um, because I was working with, I'm working with other people, but those options are going to expire or for whatever reason. Um, so, but, but I feel like, like I'm doing this and I'm going to push it, you know, I'm going to push. And then if that doesn't happen, then I'm probably going to turn around and start saying, okay, well then I got to figure out how to get this made. And, and some of these stories, <clears throat> Look, it's kind of like the, the story you did, right? Mm -hmm. I do you mind saying what the budget was for Bastard Sons? Yeah, Bastard Sons, Malicious, and St. Michael the City. All all three movies were under a hundred thousand. Under each, okay. So, you know, first of all, that's insane. But you know, the great thing about true crime movies is that you know you don't really need special sets. You know what I'm saying? You don't need, you know, you, I mean, you do, but you don't, but it's not like, Hey, we have to build the death star. Right. You know, right. We have to build a, you know, these aren't sci-fi movies. The, these are, these are movies where we can, Hey, can we use my, you know, my uncle has a huge basement, mm -hmm. you know, I, we can use my buddy Tommy's condo. Yeah. There's, there's tricks. Um, there's, I, I, I bumped up since then. I can't, my mind, my body, my anything, I, I can't do another one that low again. Um, I exhausted my resources and I'll never ask anyone for a, a favor again that I can't return. Right. Like yourself, I can't give, I can't give without, I can't get without giving. So that, that exhausted itself. Um, but then again, it doesn't mean I'm bumping up to whatever. I, I like making things low budget because at the end of the day, the movie's going to make what it makes. So if a movie makes a million dollars in 12 months, that I'm not going to make a movie for a million dollars. I'm going to make it for 400 and I'll have 600 right. right here for me and everybody else. So for me, that's, that's a entrepreneurial, you know, business decision. Um, I know filmmakers, they'll do anything they can to make money and then they just see what happens. So, well, then they end up with uh, just, they end up with 10 films that are just dog shit. Yeah. You know? And, and, like, and, and a lot of people that are just like, you suck. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just lost me a lot of money and I would never in a million fucking years take someone's money and do that. What's funny about that is I've had multiple uh, producers when this is when I first got out, but I had multiple producers come to me and want to option my life rights or option this story, option that story. And yeah. then I'd look into them and, you know, they'd pitched me. And then I'd look into him. It's like, okay, Mike Tyson is on the cover mm -hmm. of your, so you paid. And then, you know, I talked to a buddy who talked to a buddy and they were like, look, there's a whole slew of producers that will, they'll pay an actor 500,000. He'll shoot for three days. Right. You get to use them on the cover. Mm -hmm. You get to, 
So they'll raise, you know, a million dollars or whatever. Let's say half a million dollars. They give Mike Tyson 200,000. Mm -hmm. They pay themselves 200,000. They make the movie for a hundred thousand dollars. They sell the movie for almost a million dollars, or maybe they just get their money back, but they made 200,000 mm -hmm. and they make two of these films a year. Yeah. You know, so, and you know, Michael Douglas is on the cover. He gets a million dollars. He gets, you know, they raise 3 million. Their, their investors get their money back. They keep going. Yeah. But in the end, you don't have great films. Right. So, and, and you know, so I don't want to do that, but I've, I've had those producers contact me and I'm like, okay, you had this guy on the cover of this, this guy on the cover of that. I rented the movie. I'm sorry. I'd rather not have my film made. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I'm not going to do that. Like I, it's tough, man. I, and I, I respect you for saying that because you, you could very well do it and, and pocket some change and everything. But I've been in bad movies as an actor where I had no control. It's a, it's a bad fucking feeling, man. I mean, right. There, as you know, making a film, there's so many, so many spokes in that wheel. And for reasons outside of yourself, many reasons, anything could go wrong or just not be up to par. And it reflects on you. I got sick and fucking tired of that. So I'm very picky when I get a role, if I audition or I'm fortunate enough to get offers here and there. I'm very picky about who I work with because it represents you. And, right. you know, uh, going the route of doing something yourself, I find so rewarding i am built for it because like yourself i i work non-stop anyway so it's not like i'm gonna start making movies and then sit back like i kind of like overseeing it and knowing that i'm hiring the right, the right people for the job to make something that's this but what you're sacrificing and it's what went through with, with sons um it's really interesting matt because i made a movie that is not star power driven it's not big budget it doesn't feel cheap. It's just not big budget. There's no reason to have explosions and shit. Um, but I got rejected by almost every single film festival I submitted to because of the movie I made and because some things some people might find offensive. So be it. I'm from Jersey. It is what it is. That's what the movie is. And But then I turn around and I get picked up by one of the biggest distributors in Hollywood. Right? Yeah. So I get picked up by one of the biggest distributors in Hollywood. But because I don't have star power, movie star power, like these other films, um, I don't get a trade announcement. I don't get festivals. I don't get these, these variety and deadline and this and that. I don't get this big theatrical release. So what am I left with? I'm left with a knock on wood, a good movie, thanks to everyone that was involved. Something that catches on. And, um, and, and something that kind of spit like wildfire. But in order for it to do that without a marketing presence, I mean, I'm sorry, without a star power presence, I needed to capitalize on the marketing and get in front of the right people. So thank God we had a lot of really good reviews, people that I respect in the review business to drop some reviews about this movie. And then Tom, Tom Levecchia got involved. And when Tom got involved, that's what took Sons to the next level. That's what took um, the next level. I, I was going to say the... Uh the the business model that you just you know you've talked about five minutes ago which is the you know it you know making those phone calls to get connections with distributors yeah. to eventually get to a point where you can start producing something and knowing that you can distribute it to that five-year model mm -hmm. you gotta admit like no, nobody wants to do the five-year model like it's it's like um uh, I think it was Jeff Bezos who said like most overnight successes take about 10 years. Yeah. Nobody wants, they don't want to wait 10 years. They don't want to yeah. make those phone calls. They don't want to, yeah. they don't want to do that. And and I, I get that because I had a certain, I had a certain, you know, thought in my head of how things would go. But just like, like you said, I mean, I, I was supposed to fly out to LA and meet with Blumhouse. Yeah. 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 That's great. Two weeks late, two weeks before I'm supposed to go. And this was a series based on, a con man, me, it was me going to prison. It was kind of like an orange is a new black where I go to prison, but instead of Piper, it's me in prison. I'm supposed to be there. And I start writing guys stories. So as I write your story, um, you kind of then, then enter my orbit. And now you're one of the reoccurring players. So wow. it would have been like that. And listen, I'm supposed to fly out. COVID hit. Oh, Two weeks man. COVID hit. Yeah. And then they put me off and put me off. I and mean, six months later, I finally got one of the guys on the phone. I said, bro, just tell me that it's not happening. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. It's you. So many things got pushed back. It's like, okay, that's fine. It's fine. Yeah. But nobody wants to tell you no. Nobody wants to say fuck off. Like, no, you they want to hang on so no one else. Yeah. So no one else will grab you. You know, they'll right. hang on as long as they can. And I've had that happen multiple times. You know, 
got a deal with, um, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Discovery channel. Next thing you know, it gets bought out by like Disney or somebody. And right. they, you know, and then, you know, the people you were dealing with, two of them aren't there in a week. And you're yeah. like, yeah, it's I thought we had a deal. Oh, they're shifting things around and, and okay, we're good. You know, like it, those things have happened. They happen so much. And I always say, oh man, we're, we're, we're in a business where we are as creatives expendable to, to someone in a, in a power position. I don't even feel like I'm in the business. I feel like I'm the outside of the business trying to get yeah. in the business. You're yeah. The business. It's an odd feeling. Um, it's somewhat empowering doing your own thing soup to nuts. I can deal with it being an actor. It's, I'm, a, I'm a creatively uh, impassioned person. So just being an actor, that's one solo singular focus of a career that, that I've come to terms with how that goes, right? And it's going fine. It's just not enough for me. And it's not enough for other people too. But knowing that I can make a film from concept, creation to the end, um, it kind of gives me a place of like, uh, in this crazy business, a place of solidarity to stand on my own and not feel like I'm a cog in the wheel. If I can do something outside within that system, but entirely my, my own and find a way to make money doing it and then make people that invest in me, make them money. And then we do it again, you know? So it's almost like I'm within this big business model, but I'm not relying on other people. I'm, right. You know what I mean? That's a good feel. It's an empowering feeling in, 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 in an absolutely insane business where are they going to call me back? Are they going to do this? Are going to do that? Did I get the part? Did I get the... And everything involves somebody else. And that, that fucking shit drives me nuts. That someone else has power over me like that, you know? So I'll, I'll deal with it as an actor. I, I chose that, that career and that's my thing. But I don't, mind, I don't mind turning the creative wheels the other way and, and actually having like a running a business within it too, you know? Um shoot i was gonna say I, I, i'll i'll talk to you after uh, about yeah, this. I have yeah, a feeling. I, yeah because well, I, was, I was gonna say because there's one of the 12 stories i want to say was yeah it, it's one of the ones that's been you know option but you know they've got 12 of them they they're i'm sure they're gonna want to get rid of you know some of them obviously um but i was gonna say because some of them are so and, and they're all you know what's great is First of all, th this is just a synopsis. They're all true. Like you can look up, you can look up the articles. You can you can order the freedom. I have the Freedom of Information Act. You can look at the police reports. You can look at the names, the dates. Um, I have one about a guy named Jamar Towns, a black guy who was raised in the projects, never been in trouble. Mm -hmm. He's had a friend that was named Mike who 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 had been in trouble. Like he had a felony. Well, Mike one, you know, Jamar had tried to be a he, he went to school to be like a, you know, EMS, um, you know, the an emergency, you know, like a, whatever the, uh, yeah, yeah, emergency my guys. right. But he couldn't pass the test. Doesn't know why pass the score, you know, got great grades. He's like, I don't understand. I took it two, twice. And every time you take it, it's four or 500 bucks. Like I don't have the money. Yeah, yeah. He's like, passed it, uh, you know, failed it twice. He's like, I said, I'm not, I'm done. And his buddy, Mike goes, you know what you ought to do? You can get a, you don't have a, uh, you can, you're in, he was in Florida. You can get a concealed weapons permit. You get a concealed weapons permit. You can go be a, uh, a a driver for one of these um uh -huh. you know these companies like uh whatever they call them Card, uh, like all the security uh yeah the one he went with was called uh, cash logistics which is like the third largest one like loomis or so he said they make good money he is he is and if you stay there a little bit they'll they'll raise you up he said maybe we could get into a position where we could rob the place he goes and i kind of laughed about it so Jamar was kind of like, kind of like laughed about it. He's like, he was like, yeah, you're right. He was, well, they make good money and you really just have to stay there for six months or a year. And he went, he said, honestly, he said, like, I didn't, I, I knew he was serious, but I didn't think he was serious. He's like, Mike's been in trouble before he sells a little drugs here, a little here. He was, but he's always had a job. He goes, so, so Jamar goes and gets his concealed weapons permit and he does get a job and he becomes a driver and he notices that periodically some of these guys that have been there five years, eight years would show up one day when they go to turn in the bags and they scan them, right? Yeah. They're like, you're missing a bag. They're like, what? No, nah, let me check the truck. Goes and looks in the truck, comes back and goes, I don't know. They must, maybe they didn't give me one. He's like, well, it says there's six of them. You got five. He's like, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. He goes, so I write it. He goes, you write it down on the log. 
He was the next day I got, well, this is when he was, he goes, you did, there's different jobs. And he, they were training, training everybody on all the jobs. He goes, so the next day he gets called into like the manager's office and they're like, you wrote up this, what happened? He tells him what happened. He's like, okay. He's like, why? He's like, well, I mean, it was like, I forget what the amount was. It was like 60 grand or something. He goes, that was 60 grand. It's missing. The bank says they gave it to him. He says he didn't turn it in. He's like the, the driver of the truck said they never stopped. So we don't know where that bag got lost. And he's like, huh? He goes, they never fired the guy. Nothing. He said about two weeks later, he pulls in and like a, a new, a, a brand new motorcycle <laughs> and sees him. And he looks at him. He kind of looks at him and the guy is like, what's up? <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he goes, he goes, damn. He's like, I mean, was blaze, uh, brazen about it. He was never fired him. And another time he said a girl did the same thing, like 40, 50,000. He was, but when she left the back of the truck and went up, she goes, he goes, she actually walked. She, she had a big coat and he said she walked to her car and came back and turned in the bags and one of the bags was missing. And he said, so they, they checked the cameras and they were like, she went to her car. So they called the police. The police went, they searched her car. They found the bag. They didn't run. He was, they did not charge her. They just fired her. He was, cause they don't want the, they don't want the, to know that people are stealing. Oh. Right. And they got the money back. They said, yeah, you're, we're, you're just done. Well, here's what happens is eventually his buddy, Mike goes and finds a couple of guys that have already been to federal prison for bank robbery. So Jamar and he, so Jamar tells them they, they have a meeting and Jamar says, look, if you stop the truck on route, he said, and just pull out with guns. He's like, we're going to open it. We're going to, we're going to open the back. We're going to give you the money. He said, the, 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 he said, the guard is, I will, you know, either the driver or me He is, we're not, I'm not getting to a shootout. Right, right, right. He said, nobody cares. We're all making like 13 bucks an hour. I don't care. He's like, it's not my money. He goes, and they, he goes, and they tell you to give up the money. Yeah. So um, he said, there's some guys that will get into a shootout. Like they want to be in a shootout. He's, he's 95% of the guys. He said, don't. And so he told them, look, stop us on this route at this time. Set himself up. Did you write this, man? You you have. You oh, this is all done. So script what in, as well. It's a synopsis. I don't. It's not in a script. I don't know how to write script. Right, this man. Oh, listen, it gets better. So real quick, what happens is this. I'll I'll sum it up. They can't seem to stop the vehicle. Like the driver just drives around him. He's like instead of pulling right up to the thing, they they give him like twenty feet. He drives right around. Like they pull up. Because this happens on two different occasions. Another time, they're supposed to stop him. They're supposed to like get him like in the parking lot. He's like, they fucked that up. He has another time. He goes, so finally what happens is this. He is they're actually changing the the depot from one depot to a new depot. He is, he said, there's no way you're robbing that place. He is, but by this point, I'm a manager. He is, and on like Thursdays or whatever the day was, he said, it's just me and another guy. And usually the other guy says, can I leave? And they, and he lets them leave. He is, and as the trucks come in, it's just me and the truck driver. And I scan it. He goes, so it's me in the depot with 10 or $20 million. He goes, you're supposed to lock the, the locks, but nobody does. We just leave them cracked a little bit or we shut them, but we don't, we don't redo the, the time thing. Right. The, he said, we just leave them. He said, so what happens is finally he tells these guys, listen, we're moving to another depot. The last chance you fucking idiots have, and they are idiots, the two guys, he goes, the last chance you fucking idiots have, I mean, he didn't talk like this. He's actually just a very nice guy. Um, he's like, the last chance you have is that on Thursday, I'm going to be there. The trucks are coming in. I can call you on a drop phone, let you know when nobody's there, I'll go take the garbage out at this time. You guys can be in the parking lot and you can grab me with a gun, bring me inside, tie me up, go. I'll leave th both of these safes unlocked. You take the money out of the safe, throw it in the back of your vehicle and leave because you'll get $10 million. So they're like. And he's supposed to get um, a third. I was going to say, yeah, what's his cut? Yeah, His cut was supposed to be, yeah. So they say, um, okay. So what happens is they end up, they, it works exactly as planned. He calls them. He walks out to take the garbage out. It's just him. He told the other guy, hey, you can go home. It's just me. I'm waiting for two more trucks. No big deal. Guy's like, cool. So he walks out. They grab him, bring him inside. Now there's a whole bunch of things. One of the guys pistol whips the shit out of me because I thought he was going to kill me. Oh, God. He, he went yeah. that far, huh? He went that far. He's like, I passed out. Like I'm bleeding. Like he's like, of course he wanted to make it. He's kind of saying like, oh, I need to make it look real for you. 
you know, but he's like, they tied duck tied me up. He lay them down. They go into the wrong safe. They only get like 3 million. They leave like seven or 8 million. They're, they're complete idiots. If you want, listen to the whole thing, you realize they're just complete idiots. What ends up happening though, is the, the FBI shows up, they get away. The FBI shows up. They question Jamar. They question a few people. It just looks like he's robbed. They don't really believe it. Something's not quite right. Anyway, what ends up happening is um, his, they end up paying, giving him like $100,000. And keep in mind, they drop it off to his sister on the side of the highway. She picks it up and then they say, oh, well, your sister must have robbed you. We gave, we gave her a million dollars. And he's like, bullshit. So his sister's like, she drove straight. He goes, my sister wouldn't do that. So the point is, is what it, they end up saying is his buddy, Mike, is going around saying, I'm going to find that money. I want that money. These guys ripped us off. And he's telling everybody. So they put a hit out on Mike. They kill Mike, his best friend. Then they go to kill Jamar. Jamar ends up, it ends up being a thing where he gets away. Um, there's like a shootout. There's a chase. It's a whole fucking thing. But he gets away. Eventually, he runs out of the $100,000 and he decides to rob. Um, he robs one of the trucks himself. Gets away, runs, chase, they, they, they chase him. A helicopter chases him. They end up grabbing him. He gets arrested, goes to jail. The FBI agent comes to him and says, look, we know these two guys robbed you in the, in the, in the, um, uh, at the depot. We know that you work, you're done on this one. You're getting 10 years. They go, you're getting 10 years on this one done. Cause he fired his weapon. He's like, you fired the weapon. You got the money. You're getting 10 years. He goes, but. You could do way is you could do less time and we won't charge you for the depot if you just cooperate against those two guys because they've been in and out of federal prison. They're robbers. They're a, the whole group of robbers just testify against them. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And they said, OK, well, you're eventually going to get charged when we arrest him. He's like, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything. So he takes the 10 years. He goes. So six months later. They arrest the two guys for the depot robbery. They both cooperate against Jamar and say he set the whole thing up. He gets an extra 13 or 14. I think he ends up with 24, 25 years. Those two guys are out right now, by the way. They only got a few years. They're out already. He's got 25 years. Matt. Bro. Please, please don't let someone write this, dude. It's all real. And I, I mean, look, there's matter of fact, there's video. See, you don't, you, you don't do documentaries, but this would make, but here's the whole thing. Think about how many characters you've got. You got like five characters. You want to know the other funny thing? The FBI agent that was in charge of the case, while I was writing the case and ordering the Freedom of Information Act, he wouldn't release the homicide report because they know the two guys, one of the guys' name is Dewey, the main guy. They know Dewey Mert had had Mike murdered. I met a guy in Coleman that knows the guy that murdered, murdered Mike. So I had talked to him saying, Hey, you know, there's a guy Jamar here. I know that you're from his, his area. You're kind of a part of that crew. Do you know? So-and-so he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I start talking to him and he says, Oh yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, the guy that killed him is so-and-so is so-and-so's cousin. He's in prison. I order the, the state records and I find out he, he was out of prison at that point, got arrested a few weeks later. So when I, the FBI agent called, uh, so the FBI wouldn't release it, but right. he remembered my name and the FBI got a copy of my story when I put it on my website. So Jamar still locked up. I get out and probably six months ago, I get a phone call from the FBI agent and I say, Hey, what's up? He said, I read your story. I said, yeah, I remember you. I said, you wouldn't release the, the homicide report. He's like, right. well, it was an active investigation. I said, right. And I, and he said, but it seems you didn't need it anyway. You still wrote the story. And I said, yeah. And he goes, um, so my question is you talked to this guy and he told you the name. He goes, you talked to this guy. He's, did anybody ever tell you who, mur who, who, uh, hired the murderer? I said, yeah, Dewey. How do you know that? And I said, oh, so-and-so told me. And I go, it's in the story. And he goes, no, it's not. And I went, I said, oh, there's a backstory. Which story did you read? And he said, oh, I never read the backstory. Where is it? So I told him where it was. He went, he clicked on it. He read it. He came back. And the guy's name's Marvin. And he was like, so do you think so-and-so will talk to me? I said, he wouldn't at the time. I told him to talk to you, but we're locked up and you know, you're not, you're not supposed to cooperate. And I said, but I said, he may now, I said, because now you could probably get him straight out of prison. 
And he goes, well, I'm going to fly out there and, and talk to him. I said, bro, let me know what happens. So I don't know. I don't know what happened. Dude. But he, he's called me. The story is on my website. It's called, it's called cash logistics. It's got a picture of Jamar. It's a great story. And, yeah, and I, you only need a few players. You had very few, no more than you already had. I got I got to ask you, man. Why? Why? Why would you give that to someone else? To me, well, I didn't know you. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't like, do what you're what? doing. I can't. And everybody that reads these stories, it's the same thing. It's somebody they got to talk to Jennifer. They got to talk to John. They got. And usually, the people I talk to have been documentary people. And Jamar's still doing his time. He doesn't get out to like like fucking twenty thirty five or something. You have a really good thing going. And, and the fact that the industry in certain regards is opening up their arms to you is a, is a sign and a testament to, to your, your talents. Let me, let me throw this at you. I'm not making this about me, but I just want to give you a, 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 something I went through, which is why I will never fucking do it again. And I've had many never again moments in this business, and I'm sure you've had them in, in, as well. This is mine. It might shed some, shed some light on you. I grew up in a family construction business in Jersey. The first month I was in Iraq, I was in my bunk and I filled up a journal with a story. And that story was about my life and the upbringing I had and the fellas I hung around with. And it, I embellished more of the story in a way that my friends and I were leaning that we may have went this route into essentially what was at the time would be at the beginning of a, of a gang. Right. Doing, um, making money illegally. That, that, that's it. So the whole essence, the name of this movie was called Blue Collar Boys. And the whole idea of Blue Collar Boys was at that time in 2008, when the money crisis was going on and, and the, the, you know, the hard, the worker man was getting beat down and all that stuff. How would a gang start today? How would a mob start today? And it starts with a couple of rebels that just had enough that were smart and figured it out. And like, oh, we could actually make money doing this. That's what the movie was. I wrote it about myself. I wrote it about my father, who's the most honest, hardworking, humble man you'll ever meet. And, and essentially my friends. But I didn't write it to play the lead role. I wrote it to play the second lead, who was essentially my best friend in real life. Just a fucking maniac. So when I wrote it, at the time, I didn't know how, I didn't, I wasn't confident in writing a screenplay, even though I had the story all there. And it was obviously very personal to me. I did a sh couple short films with this dude. He's not even a dude. He's a piece of shit. And I, 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 uh, I brought it to him and he, with, with utmost confidence, promised me that he could write this script and make this movie as his first feature. Make a long story go, he, he failed. He crumbled. And the movie got made by hook or by crook. It got made. I dumped all the money I put into Baghdad in this movie. Literally, I just kept it in a separate account. That $29,000 I made being out in war, yeah. that, that wasn't like I won that, put it all on black. That's special fucking money. I earned every cent of that shit. I put into this movie. Blue Collar Boys got made. By the time the movie was in the editing room, myself, my brother who helped produce it, three other guys, four other guys, all pulled our name off the project and wanted no association with this egomaniac. He, he completely went maniacal and held everything himself, did what he wanted to do, made all the business decisions and not being smart enough at the time, every movie has its own LLC. He had a business at the time and me not knowing any better, he's like, well, we're going to finance this now, right? We were going to co-finance it. I said, yeah. He's like, we'll just cut the check to my company. He had a business already. I was like, well, shouldn't we do like an LLC for the movie? And he's like, no, 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 we're good. I'm like, okay, here's your check. Mm. I literally, because of lack of knowledge and lack of belief in myself, <clears throat> gave somebody a, not only a, a good movie, a good story to go with, but a, a piece of my fucking heart. And that movie, if it was done slightly different, it still came out pretty good. It had the worst release known to man, which is why I had one of those never again moments, especially with Bastard Sons, which is why Tom Lavecki is like a godsend to me. Um, it just came and went. And it's a good movie and no one ever heard about it. Mm. I'm almost glad because then this motherfucker would have made money, but I, I you know, uh, because of the selling of it, but 
Matt, th this, this story is so unique. If you give, you are perfectly well capable of writing a script and making it your own. If you just knew the right people and had the right people around you, rather than writing the story, getting something, you know, uh, 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 an advance or whatever, and then someone else can go take it and do their thing and take it to the bank. And you're just kind of left there like this. Now, there's nothing wrong. If that's what you want to do, man, by all means, you know, you've been around a block more than I have. But holy shit, if you really want to put your thumbprint on something, say, no, I'm going to fucking ride this one out and possibly make money on it and do it the right way. There is rules to this game. And if you follow right. the rules, you know, I look at it like this, man. Make, making a movie is kind of like painting. Remember when you're kids, like painting in the numbers? Like my daughter has that shit, right? You got the little picture of a dinosaur or whatever, and it's got this one little area, this little area, and it says one, two, three, one is red, two is orange, okay? Making a movie reminds me of that. It's this palette that you have to work within. That palette is the genre. You can be creative and color it however the fuck you want. That's what makes that picture good. Or you could just follow the rules and do one is red, two is black, three is this. But if you are as creative as possible within that, like a simple story like this, I was creative as possible and interesting as possible within a very simple story, that's what puts it up. And then the genre you choose puts it there. And then the people you choose puts it there. If you follow these rules, kind of like these guys you were talking about, where, you know, we'll get Nick Cage, pay him two, raise three, you should put that in our pocket, make them. It's like that, that wheel. You know what I mean? It's the wheel. There's a system for that too. That's kind of frowned upon a little bit. The movies aren't that good. But if something, I'm, I'm listening to you talk about it. And, you know, I, 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 I think you're an impassioned person as well. And if something fucking tickles you a little bit, man, don't deny it. If there's something about that story, you're like, I could see this happening. Fuck, well, do it, man. Don't give I, it to I, somebody else. Well, first of all, I've already, I've, they, I, it's already a part of a package. They have nine, they, but they have nine months. Ah. You know what I'm saying? They have nine months and I signed the package, signed it a month or signed it a month ago. Like you got eight months. Like we're just now having, so, you know, will they extend it? That's fine. They'd have to pay me again, but. You know, and will they do anything? I don't know. And could I, can I bring somebody to the table and say, Hey, this is what we want to do. And you know, that's possible. They just knew that they reviewed my stuff and they said, look, every, and honestly, every one of these stories is super unique. You have to understand the position I was in. Yeah. There's 2000 inmates with a 50% turnover rate. So I'm meeting there's three, I'm coming in contact with 3000 people. And after I got the first, this group of guys in Rolling Stone magazine, guys are coming up to me. You know, guys are walking around the compound, reading the article, looking up and seeing me and going, hey, <laughs> and, you know, the guards are saying, yo, bro, that was a great article. And I'm like, that's cool. You know, and so I've got inmates coming to me going, Cox, Cox, you know, guys, I, I've never talked to. Yeah. I didn't even talk to that many people. And, and I, they Cox and I go, yeah, what's up? And he, listen, my fucking roommate, just got here last night. You can't believe it. you got to talk to him. I'm going to bring him to where, what's, what, what unit are you in? And so every, every other day I'm hearing guys stories and I'd hear some stories and you know, I'd hear the story and I'd be like, you know, I get it. You were raising the projects. Everybody you knew was a drug dealer. You started selling drugs. You, that, you know, your mom, your dad, you're this, you're that, you know, your cousin, you know, uh, there was somebody got caught. They wore a wire. Like they tell me their story and I'd be like, and I get it. And it's a tragedy. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but I could throw a rock and, and bounce off of four guys that have that story here. Like it, and it's been told a hundred times. So there's nothing unique about it. You know, and I'm sorry. And you should write that. I always say you should write it and I'll help you. If you want to write an outline, I'll help you do it. But I can't, I can't dedicate three to six months of my life to that, you know, um, cause I'm putting up the money to, to, to type it out. Everything costs in prison to type it out on core links, to write it up, to do that's all on me. You know, and then I, what I would do is I'd make them split it. I'd be, I'll give you 50% of anything I make. And if you attach your life rights, if you don't attach your life rights, then you get nothing. I'll still write the story, but I'm going to keep the story. Smart, man. And, and Smart. of course these guys are, would, would absolutely bro. Where do I sign? Yeah. They've been telling the story for seven years. They're getting out in five. Like they, they just like, I had guys walking up to me every other day saying, Cox, I just read that story you wrote, you know, um, whatever cash and coke or american narcos 
you know, uh, uh, do you, you got another, or you got another one like that, but a drug story. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I got a drug story. Hold on. I'd go upstairs and give it to him and it'd be 10 pages and he'd read it and bring it back. And Hey, you got another one. I heard you wrote one on so-and-so. Yeah, I got it. So all the stories are unique because I only wrote unique stories. Even if they, at first I didn't want to write drug stories at all, but I, a guy came to me and he pitched his story and I'd had several pitched to me and he pitched it in such a way that I was like, it, it was, it was a very unique story. And that's actually those guys I got into Rolling Stone, even though it was a drug story. Um, but here's what I'm thinking that the, whenever I think about that story, um, the cash logistics one, because listen, the guy is so sympathetic, like his, everything about his story, his, his plight is sympathetic and he's not a bad guy. Um, is that all I, because everybody in the story is black. So to me, you could fill it with just hip hop guys. Mm -hmm. You know, you could fill it with guys that are like, look, I'll do it for next to nothing. I have a following. I'll do it for nothing just to be in. And they'll bring their, they'll bring their, their people with them to watch. If, if you couldn't get a big time actor, maybe you get some guy who's going to be big time actor. Well, the business is changing, man. I mean, you know, what used to, what, what used to be about talent and box office value the, the, the theatrical model is so on its ass right now. Film distributors and foreign sales reps, they can't even give you an accurate thing. They really can't. It used to be like, hey, I got three actors I'm going to cast. Uh, tell me what their your high and low buy is once the movie's made, if you were going to take it. They used to be able to give you, give you, you know, like they would tell you straight up numbers. Now it's like, maybe this, we don't know, but, 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 but they try to save their ass, but they, they don't know. And I've spoken to a couple big distributors and oddly enough, social media numbers they hope social media numbers matter. They hope. Right. Because sometimes it translates and sometimes it doesn't. If you got a hockey player starring in a movie, you know, the hockey audience might not like that player in a movie. You know what I mean? Uh, Frankie's, I'm looking at him behind me. Frankie's audience, um, it's his first movie. Frankie never acted before. He did a commercial years ago, but him and half the cast is not actors for that realistic feel I wanted. Um, I barely had any money to do this movie, man. Everyone did me a solid jumping in because, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful they, they believed in me enough to do it and want to be a part of this. But everyone's audience, including Frankie's, I had no idea. And I didn't bank on it either. They loved the idea of him being in a movie. I was like, this is yeah. fucking great. You know, he's been doing podcasts and everything in support of the film and and Roger as well and Malik. And, you know, it, it's funny how it translates. But social media numbers, if they're real it could translate. So you don't even necessarily need a star anymore. If you right. have someone that their audience wants to see them in a movie and you get collectively a bunch of them and you get the right marketing company behind it. Right. I didn't need a theatrical release. I got five cities. That's I didn't need the big, you know, AMC stuff. Sun's popped on its own. It just, people started talking about it. And Tom pushed out to, he didn't force anyone or bend anyone's arm. He just told them about the movie and people were just hitting me up like crazy crazy man it was wild so yeah you got something there man you got something there i hope selfishly for you they don't take that story does that sound right <laughs> the problem is every story is like that i have to every one of them with my friend um okay in bastard sons the dude that came out of the red car his name was guy he had the mustache Real it the one, was it, it was it it was muddy the car was parked in the mud and yeah yeah, yeah. it's my buddy chuck that's chuck mcclain chuck is one of the most sought out writers in hollywood he's the creator of city on the hill ben affleck hit him up to create the movie the showtime series with kevin bacon that's okay. how i met chuck because i was on it my wife was a series regular we've since become friends he's a fucking character that's chuck whoever you saw in that movie yeah he was he was a smart ass to oh the, yeah uh, he's like how do you want me to be? I'm like, just, just do you brother. I said, just, just do you, you know? Um, and he was great. Never acted before. I cast appropriately yeah, comfortable and he just went with it. Well, Chuck has written with, he's been asked to write with Sean Penn, Stallone, Jason Momoa, Russell Crowe. They, they seek him out. He's one of the best writers around. He would, Man, he would eat your stories alive if, if you guys talked. And I, I'll put you in touch. We'll talk after this, man. Um, he's incredible. He's an incredible writer. And if you're going to have anyone write something for you but keep it internally or have someone involved, 
that's that's the kind of guy because when the time comes matt let's say you did something your own and it takes a little time you know a right year, a, a year and a half from now you're yelling action or someone else's your popularity is rising very quickly and it might not just totally be reliable on the cast you bring there's other factors depending on the genre how you stack it what you do so we'll talk man i'd love to see something like that of yours you know come through for you with i can control I can already hear in the comment section. So like, how did Matt Cox make this about him? No, this is interesting. <laughs> no, thing, man. I know, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> no guys, listen, guys are vicious to me. They're like, this uh, guy interviewed <laughs> this other guy. No, no, no. This is just as uh, much interesting to me as, as I hopefully, hopefully it is for you and everyone listening, man. I hope, um, but yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a business that will take advantage of you hook, line and sinker, man. And if, and, that's why I love the fact that there's streaming platforms. Remember when it was just Blockbuster? Yeah. Fucking world was much better when there was just Blockbuster, man. These streaming apps popped up and everyone and their mother, and now they're buying this and that. But here's what it did do. What it did do was it make it possible for someone like me, who's not a Hollywood actor, I'm just a steady working actor that, that made a career out of acting in independent films. It made someone like me who just has good business sense as well, make an independent film and like the one behind me or malicious, when they get released, I can compete with the big boys. Something like that movie right there, when Bastard Sons got released, it popped that opening weekend so hard that on Amazon, or I'm sorry, iTunes, it was like Oppenheimer, Bastard Sons, and it's something else. Nice. And I was like, wow. Like that, that's the power of a streaming service. I'd have to go through big Hollywood this and Hollywood that. That's the streamer saying we support independent artists and filmmakers. Make something good and we'll put it with with other good ones, you know, and then, the, you know, the apples fall where they may. But you have the ability as an independent, an entrepreneur of any kind to make a film. And if you make it the right way, you can compete. And you have that opportunity. You don't have that opportunity going theatrical release. Those are millions and millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But for you know, under hundred thousand dollar movie to be next to a hundred million dollar movie, you know, so it's possible if you just play the cards, right. You know, you don't, you're not sacrificing yourself. You're not, you just know the game and you do the best you can within it. You know what I mean? So I feel like I'm pitching you, bro. Am I no, pitching? It's, I, it's I, trust me. I, I, you know, I, I need to be pitching. And the problem is, like I said, like a year or so ago when the channel really started doing well and I, 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 I step back, not that I've ever really pitched these stories. And I did, I, I have, you know, if somebody came to me, I talked to them, they'd option it for whatever, nine months. I, they always try and get you 18. I typically yeah. talk to them for nine, um, you know, and then, you know, they give you a little bit of cash and in nine months, nothing's happened. They go away or maybe they come back and they, they do something, but they're never going anywhere. And you realize that this is my project is now one of five that you're walking into Netflix pitching. Well, it's you know, not them, not, not to cut you off, Matt. I, I no, to make free phrase that it is them the way that works. And, and tell me, you probably, you might know this already is that they're actually just waiting to get someone attached that warrants the budget. Yeah. Yeah. It's not I, them I, like, Hey, this great story from Matt, we got this great story from Matthew Cox. Let's go find a financier. It doesn't go like that. They're yeah. circulating with agents trying to get an actor attached to it. Cause if that actor comes into it, they can go right to the bank and leverage X amount of dollars off of him. So they wait. That's why I say, give us nine months or whatever, because that actor might be busy for a little while. You know what I mean? Right. What I've been doing, and it's almost like a side business, but it's not cause it's this business is I've been benefiting myself, not only the films that I'm getting cast for, but the ones I'm making because I have the relationships overseas with foreign sales reps and buyers and, you know, Germany just bought this and malicious and Australia and Iceland, all that shit. I'm actually building my own value to be that guy. So when I release a film that I'm playing the lead in, I'm actually have value enough for my own film to get it sold to the people I know as well and not have to rely on getting a big actor signed to it to be able to raise the money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Most yeah. myself in house, but that's what they're, that's what they're doing. That's why they hold on to it. They hope so-and-so frees up. You know, see, that's well, I'm mean, not that I think I can know how to go about even getting a big actor, but I was that's why I was thinking someone that was more like a, a, a hip hop guy, Could work. you know, yeah. you know, first of all, I think I can I can get close to most of those guys. They see my channel. They see the numbers. They yeah. they know I went to prison. They suddenly think I'm cool. They want to talk to me. 
So then it's, it's easy to get in the door. And if you get somebody who's kind of on the upscale and you say, look, I'll give you a percentage of the movie. I can't really pay you. I can pay, obviously fly you out, put you in a hotel, do that, but I can't pay you, but you can get a percentage of the movie. And then obviously you help, you know, yeah. you help advertise the movie, you help get it out there. Um, so, I mean, that's why I thought, and you could also say, Hey, look, can we use your mute? You know, you also get to use your music in the soundtrack, you know, that kind of stuff. There's some things that it benefits everybody all around sure. the movie's great. It's huge. It's huge. If it's not, well, it's fine. You still got a music career. Yeah. You know, if like they all want to be a, an actor. Oh, everybody love, love. It's, it's, it's fun. You know what I mean? It's when something, when something doesn't hit, it ain't, it ain't fun. But when, when it gets to that point and someone has a platform to be on that moves people and it's popular. Yeah. I mean, people eat it up. The let's just say, let's just hypoth hypothetically speaking, since we just met Matt, I'm, and I'm 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 pitching you your next movie that you should do. If let's just say you made this film, right? Because it starts with you. You ultimately are the shot caller. You're the producer. You open up the LLC. You don't let anybody else open up that shit. You're the one cutting the checks. Every decision that's made is is on you right now that dictates how good and how far the movie's going to be. That's all on you. Doesn't mean you have to lift a finger to produce it if you want to bring someone in to produce, or it doesn't mean you have to direct it if you bring the right person in to direct, but it still falls on you being a business owner, what happens, just like anything else, right? Any other business. If you're a first timer in the movie business, when you start going to a different tier of actor, I'll use myself as an example of if someone that never made a movie before, but even was kind of known, hit me up and was like, Hey, I have a, a big following here and this and that, yada, yada, yada. I'm making a movie love to, for you to play the lead. I would immediately look, look you up on IMDb, look up the film and see who was attached. And no one, if no one was attached that has actually executed a film yet that performed and did well and was known, I'm more likely than not, unless it was a lot of Shkarol, would not do it because, because there there's, it's an obvious reason that if no one is there to helmet at that point, it will probably go nowhere and look right. back for my career and then devalue me. So if you had one or two people on your team, when you start that you bring in those two core people that have been around, that have made something that is known, uh, performed well, you're on your way. Right. That's when the casting directors look at it. Talent agents look at it. Everyone looks at it. It opened, it's just, it's just the door opening thing. You know, it literally, making a movie literally is like starting a business from, from, from ground up. Right. LLC, the owner, who's the managers, and then the employees, we take it from there. And if you stack it the right way and you're good, you're, you're a smart dude, dude, you, you, you'll do it the right way. If you, if you were willing to make this movie uh, or any, any, any story into a script, um, yeah, we'll talk. I won't steer you wrong, man. I've been through it enough times to know now, you know, like what to do, what not to do. And God, I had, like I said, I had enough never again moments, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, if that timing ever came, I, I, uh, I'm here. Open door, man. You let me know. Hey, if you like the video, you guys do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Also, I'm going to leave all of um, Kevin's uh, links for all the movies and his social media in the description box. Um, do me a favor and leave comments, share the video, and please consider joining my Patreon. It really does help. Thank you very much. See ya.